Because I want to get into uh, the whole issue of pacification and, and policing of the local level. This is the idea of a security state that Israel is trying to push on, onto the world. Israel has this, this concept. And that is you do securitization, like the global war on terror, so that includes everybody, right? Fought in a domestic battle space. It's not wars abroad necessarily. And for that, the police are militarized. And then homeland security is a way of spanning the military and police. Because the problem in the United States and Western countries is there's a firewall between internal, external, inside, outside, military, civilian, CIA, FBI. And that's very, that's very, um, you know, that's very important, you see? So you have, for example, in the United States, you have the military here, you have domestic security and police over here, right? And they're very separate. There's a few cases, uh, you know, where there was direct military intervention um, by a security force, or, or, or by, uh, no, all right, direct military intervention by an army in a, in a domestic situation. For example, the National Guard in Little Rock, you know, that Eisenhower sent in. Um, New Orleans after the Hurricane Katrina. The Occupy Movement, which is very interesting, where the army plays. You know, there, there are cases like that, but they're very, very rare. I mean, you go back to the 1930s for some of them. And then there are cases in the United States and other countries where police are militarized. SWAT teams are the best example. SWAT teams are militarized police. 30 years ago, there were four SWAT teams in the United States. They had Los Angeles, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. Today, 85% of American police forces have SWAT teams, including, you know, southeastern Missouri, north central Idaho. <laughs> they all have with military weapons. So you have the militarization of the police, but it's still... I mean, as you know, it's very controversial. Jewish Jewish Peace has a program called Deadly Exchange, which is trying to uh, raise public consciousness about that. But this is the system in the United States and other Western countries where you have that division. In Israel, uh, in Israel, you don't have that division. Israel is the only Western country where there is no division like that. There's a stabbing in the Damascus Gate. Everybody's there. The army. Use the mic, please. Huh? The mic. I'm sorry. There's the army. When there's a stabbing at, at the uh, Damascus Gate, the army is there. The border police are there. The regular police are there. The Duv Devan and Yassam units are there. Um, everybody comes. You know, a lot of the. Pro if you think about crime programs that you see on TV, there's a murder. And it's often around the FBI comes in and the local police resist the There's a, a fighting between the local police and the FBI over jurisdiction. And then, you know, everybody's fighting about that. That's what you have in this country, and it's a good thing. But Israel is trying to say, to have a real security state, you have to combine your militaries and domestic securities, like we do. These are completely... Uh, combined units. They don't fit, they, they fit in, in, into both. So that, uh, and in this kind of policing, which is called high intensity policing, the people are seen as the enemies or as terrorists, not as citizens to be protected. There's a very fundamental change. So that's what Israel is trying to, to bring in. Uh, so the police are militarized, Homeland Security becomes that bridge. You see, between the military, that's what's put together, the military and the police. And then you get to a state of exception, or a state of emergency that suspends civil protections, like the Patriot Act, that is much more, that keeps getting renewed. It's not even a, an issue anymore, but it, it's renewable, the Patriot Act. That leads to repressive laws and regulations. Uh, that they give more police power to the police, due process is weakened, and then it gets into this globalized, securocratic logic, 
where everybody, you know, immigrants, just think of Trump's rhetoric. The immigrants, the criminals, the M13, the terrorists, the, you know, this and that. So the local police, the state of exception, insecurity gets, gets tied into a global system. And then populations that are seen as being, you know, uh, uh, exceptional or poor or threats or restive, you know, become targeted, and then that gets into a kind of secure kind of warfare. So the whole, so the whole thing revolves around the security state and pacification. In the end, the goal is to pacify us, to to make us incapable of resistance. Uh, and you see that the best example for me is the airport, airport security. There is no need in the 21st century to take your computer out of the bag. There's no need. The Europeans have been trying to change that for years, but the Americans are insistent and won't certify their airports if they don't do it. In Europe, you don't take off your belt. You don't take off your shoes. You know, all those things you don't have to, but you know, people do it automatically here. You, you can tell American tourists to Israel because they're the ones that are walking around without shoes. <laughs> you know, we pacify ourselves. That's, that's kind of the point of this whole thing. And the militarized police and, all, and, and this change in the structure, which gets into technologies. So <clears throat> the Israeli weapons industry is one of Israel's companies that produces the Uzi submachine gun. Well, the Uzi is the most popular submachine gun in the world. Not only with police and military, but with the criminal gangs, drug cartels. The Uzi is in movies all the time. Now, the Israel weapons industry has just opened a plant in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to supply American law enforcement officers and this huge American gut nut market, right? So what they're doing is they're taking military weapons and reducing them into weapons for, for law enforcement or even for civilian use. So the Uzi used to be a small submachine gun that you'd hold like this. Now it's reduced to a pistol. So the next time your local policeman stops you, <laughs> On the street, he could easily be pulling out an Uzi submachine gun from his holster. Here's another example of the Israel weapons uh, industry's weaponry. This is called the X-95 assault rifle. That's used by the Israeli army, but they've reduced it for, for, for you see, Israel weapons industry? They've reduced it for, for law enforcement here. So it's a, it's a combined assault rifle, carbine, submachine gun. So you say, well, okay, why carbine? You know what a carbine is? That's the rifle you hunt deer with. Why would you put that together with a submachine gun and an assault rifle? Because in the United States, a carbine can be sold across the counter. You can buy a carbine at Walmart. You see? So by putting a carbine component into, the, into an assault rifle, you make it available to the, to the greater market. So it's really an example of how weapons are being, are being made from military into law enforcement into weaponry for the general public. Uh, all right, there's all kinds of non-lethal so-called technologies of repression as well. Israel's developer example, Skunk, which is a kind of spray that is a, leaves a terrible smell. So first of all, it's a, it disperses crowds, but it lasts for weeks. You can't get it off your house, you can't get it off yourself. You can wash and wash and wash and wash, and it's weeks and weeks and weeks before you can get the this, this sentry moved to such a degree that people, sometimes demonstrations are put outside of their villages by their own families because they can't stand the stench. And of course, it makes it easy for the police to pick them up later. So these are kinds of, of technologies. They're not really non-lethal because if you have allergies, or there's different kinds of conditions, they can kill you, but they're sold as non-lethal technologies. So in the end, what I'm trying to do with my book is, is something bigger than just Israel-Palestine. 
I'm trying to work with the left here, although that's not an easy assignment, <laughs> to say, if we want to go beyond the hegemony of global capitalism, corporate capitalism, what new system do we have to, you know, I think the Occupy movement, maybe, I, I don't live here, maybe I, I'm not correct, seemed to be part of the reason why the Occupy movement collapsed is it had nothing to offer in a way. I mean, it got to a point where oh, you're talking about rent controls, you're talking about this, you're talking about that, but we don't have, on the left, a concept of a new global system. Are we talking about socialism? Are we talking about David Harvey, who's a well-known Marxist, talks about a revolutionary humanism? Uh, Life-centric hegemony has been, in, instead of a, uh, of a profit-centric hegemony has been suggested. What is this new system that we want? And until we can begin to define that, we can fight corporate capitalism, but it's going to win because it has the weaponry and, and it has the political program. So I'm trying to put all this within a larger political framework, uh, and uh, we'll see how that goes. You know, Israel has privileged access to American military technology. There's been numerous congressional um, the bills and programs that, that, that allow that. Israel has access that Europeans don't have to American military technology. Um, and Israel, I think, is seen as an extension of the military-industrial complex. You know, it's the laboratory. And it, it, you know, uh, for example, the Israeli Air Force got the new F-35 self bombers before the American Air Force got them. Because it was much better if Israeli pilots test it out. And if they, if they crash, <laughs> or things don't work, rather than American pilots. I mean, that's part of it. But you know, Israel provides a laboratory in the Middle East, much better than some field in Texas, you see. So Israel has privileged access to American technology. And what's true is that Israel is then, um, is then uh, uh, transferring that technology to other countries, including China. There's a huge argument now between Israel and the United States over technology transfer to China. Israel just had to cancel a big contract with Croatia for, um, for, for old Israeli planes because they contain American technologies. Um, do you know, I'll show you how serious it, it, it got. During the Bush, the Sun administration, where you had these Jewish neocons. You know, Paul Wolfowitz was, was the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Um, and Faith, uh, De not Daniel. Faith, F-E-I-T-H. Yeah. Yeah. What? Doug, Doug is Faith. Yeah. Was the was a special undersecretary and so on. Um, <coughs> Faith, who's a Jewish neocon in the in the Bush administration, threatened that the United States would cut diplomatic ties with Israel if Israel did not stop transferring American military technology to China. It got to that point where Jewish neocon was threatening Israel, <laughs> and uh, uh, and in fact. They, they forced Israel to fire Amos Yaron, who was the, the Director General of the Ministry of Defense in Israel. And until today, he's not allowed to set foot in the United States. This is, you know, 20 years later. So, you know, it's noticed by the United States. I mean, I think Israel has protection of Congress. But the Pentagon is very, very split. Some of the Pentagon are, are in favor of Israel and like to work with Israel because of its technological sophistication. But others are really afraid of Israel and, uh, and are very resentful of the fact that Israel gets... Now, there's enough, you know, there's all kinds of things. But for example, other countries that get American military aid have to spend that money in the United States. So it's really a subsidy to the American defense industry. But Israel only has to spend 70% of the money it gets, and it gets about four billion dollars a year um, in the United States. The other 30 percent it's allowed to use for the development of its own uh, military industry. So the fact that you have privileged access to cutting-edge American technology 
and a few billion dollars a year to develop it, plus your own resources. Um, uh, and in a way, you know, you become a competitor in the United States in many places. You know, shows this problematic uh, relationship. You know, one reason why why countries prefer Israeli drones to American drones, for example, is the United States sells drones, but it won't sell the black box. You know, the drones contain technologies that it doesn't want other countries to have, and information. So you can buy an American drone, but you don't buy all the technology and information that's in it. Israel will sell, sell you the whole thing. You see, so it's much better to buy an Israeli drone than it is an American drone, just as one example. So, you know, there's all kind. I write about this in detail in my book. And of course, again, Israel-China, I'm writing an article about that now because this is like the, the polar ends. The two countries that have no constraints whatsoever on the use of these technologies. You know, China with its huge uh, Uyghur, but also this social credit system on its own people, and then Israel with the Palestinians. So, uh, you know, what you're seeing in China and Israel is in a sense a fore, the forerunner of what you're liable to see you know, in the future of this country. You know, Europe is developing the Watchkeeper drone. That's going to be the European drone, which is owned 51% 51 51 by Elbit Systems. So it's an Israeli drone that's being Europeanized. And I try to go here a little bit. I couldn't put everything on the map, but I sort of go country by country and talk about, the, you know, Germany is selling Israel nine nuclear-capable submarines. You know, Britain has two nuclear submarines, <laughs> or one, even. one or two. Uh, China, I think, has two. Israel is going to have nine nuclear submarines in Germany, with all the technologies that that implies. So you have that, but Israel is trying. That, I mean, your point is really interesting. Again, Europe is trying to push back against the security state idea. Look what we've done in Israel. We have a country that's a, vi a vibrant democracy for our people, economically flourishing, everybody has personal security, in a country where half the population are terrorists. <laughs> Imagine if we can do that in Israel, what we could do for you in Belgium. So the Belgians push back because it's true. They really are sensitive to their social democracies. But it's, it gets weaker and weaker, especially as you have a populist movement arising in Europe, and you've got this anti-immigrant sentiment and so on. So, so what I'm saying is, in some ways, the most dangerous export of Israel is this concept of the security state that I think is developing with China. Well, I haven't gotten the hard data yet. You know, that then it's trying to, to, to export to Europe, to the United States, the Global South is much easier, because the Global South is already tuned into that kind of, uh, of relationship. The New York Police Force has an office in Tel Aviv. Oh, great. You have, they have an actual office presence, you know, you have a New York Police office in, in Israel. Um, yeah, you know, this is all, um, uh, I mean, a lot of this is, is it's true, it's secret. You know, I'm not privy to everything, but a surprising amount of this information is public. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, all these technologies are being developed. Um, some of which are still illegal. Um, but, you know, Israel is trying very much to change the rules. It has a, it has a campaign called Lawfare, uh, run partly by B'nai B'rith. And lawfare says um, terrorists uh, are using human rights against us, against democracies, because they don't follow human rights, and we have to, human rights conventions, international law. So in a way, we're fighting with one hand tied behind our back. So lawfare means let's get rid of all those constraints on our militaries. Basically, what Israel's trying to do is to remove constraints uh, on war against the people. There are two fundamental 
principles in the wars of, of engagement. One is called the principle of, of, um, like, at, at any rate, of, um, at any rate, one of the principles is you can't kill or harm non-combatants, civilian populations. The principle of distinction, it's called. Which means that, you know, in war you can't attack civilians. Well, Israel is saying, hey, terrorists don't dress in uniforms. A three-year-old girl could be carrying a bomb. Let's eliminate this, this combat, non-combatant distinction. Which, is, which would be pretty dangerous, giving the states the right to attack anyone that they decide, decide is, a, is a terrorist. The second principle is called the principle of proportionality. And that is that you're, you, you're not allowed to attack a population disproportional to the threat. So what Israel is doing in Gaza right. is completely illegal according to the principle of proportionality. So, so the lawfare campaign is trying to eliminate these, uh, these two fundamental <coughs> principles in international law. And in that way, strengthen the state's hand. And once the state's hand, you know, and that goes back to this whole pacification circle, then you can, then these technologies that are in the drawer, that are today illegal, will, once you have more authority as a security <coughs> state, then you can begin to use these, te these, um, these technologies that you can't use today. So, for example, one more, you know, uh, in the United States, you're not allowed to, you're not supposed to be racial profiling in airports. Racial profiling, ethnic profiling is illegal. I'm sure, you know, it's not, it's, it, anyway, it, it is. It's not in Israel. In Israel, on the contrary, Israel says you're stupid. You know who the terrorists are. We have algorithms. You know, we have, we have profiles. We know who the terrorists are. Why are you spending your time with the 80-year-old person in the wheelchair and the six-year-old kid that's got to stand there and put his hands over his head? And everybody has to do the same thing when you know that 98% of the people aren't the problem. You know who the problematic people are. So why don't you profile them like we do? You save time, you save energy, and it's more efficient. No one, you know, it's been 30 years now, 40 years since there's been an attack in the Tel Aviv airport. So, you see, that's again, that kind of erosion, you know, because it makes sense to people. You know, we want security. We want our government to bring security. So security is a very dangerous term because it's non-problematic. I want security, of course, and I want my government to bring it to me. So. Whatever the government decides to do, I accept. Now, uh, what I'm saying in my book, I'm trying to get us to use the word pacification. Because, because pacification brings up issues. So, you say, I want security. Okay, fine. Do you want to be pacified? What if, we, what if we substitute the word pacification for security? Do you want to be pacified? That brings up the question then that security doesn't bring up. Who wants to pacify me? How are they pacifying me? Why are they pacifying me? And all of a sudden these, these uh, techniques in the airport begin to take on a much more critical political uh, you know, aspect than they do if you simply say security. So, you know, that's why I'm saying even the language is being used covers a political reality that we have to be aware of. I think, I think there's two levels here. One is by focusing on some of these things and the American involvement, um, you're able to see how the occupation works, what Israel is doing, but also again, how it rebounds to the United States. My, in my, all my talks, I'm trying to say to people, you know, it's very nice and it's important that we have solidarity with the Palestinians for their human rights and their suffering and all that stuff. But, but it's not a faraway conflict affecting somebody over there. As your homeland security and police become Israelized, and you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg here, as they become Israelized, you are becoming Palestinianized. You're becoming Palestinians. Because if Israel is attacking Gaza, it's not attacking the 
the Palestinians, they don't matter. They're the guinea pigs. What Israel is doing is using them, but it's really, the idea is to, to, to uh, outfit your police forces. So you become the end users, the recipients of these technologies. So in a way, it's, it's kind of a reflective BDS, because it's a BDS that focuses on, on Israel and exposes these powerful things, including that Israel is a powerful country and not a victim, which is also an important message. But it also reflects back in terms of American technologies or technologies being brought into America. I mean, this whole campaign of JVP, deadly exchange, you know, is in a sense a very good kind of a, of a program because it's, it's highlighting, uh, you know, how Israel is working with the American police. So I think, yes, I think BDS should, should really begin to, uh, to go into those areas more because that's what brings it home. The message being the occupation is here. You know, your companies are complicit, your police forces are complicit, your universities are complicit, and, uh, and, and it's endangering your civil liberties. I mean, this isn't only endangering Palestinians, it's coming back to endangering all of us. And I think that's the message that we should try to, try to develop more. Mm -hmm.